All right. I think we can get started now. And as people roll in, uh, they, can, they can join us. Uh, my name is David Meyer. I'm the Digital Communications Manager here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And we're very excited to have everybody here and this uh, beautiful day here in Minnesota for Boundary Waters Day with REI. And it's shaping up to be a great day. We're, uh, we're glad you chose to join us for this presentation. Hopefully you get outside and enjoy some of the nice weather and, and outdoors uh, even today after, after what's been a long, cold winter. We're very excited to have Dan Pauly here too to share tips on planning your next Boundary Waters trip. So for anyone who's not familiar with us, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness is a nonprofit that's been working to protect the boundary waters and the surrounding ecosystem for over 40 years through advocacy. And we continue that work today uh, with lots of help from you and the rest of our Boundary Waters community. Um, we also promote wilderness education and connect young people to the Boundary Waters through our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program. And we work to support the communities that are gateways to the Boundary Waters. And uh, we also work to help folks get connected to the BWCA through education and resources through presentations like this. And uh, our website has a ton of information on exploring the Boundary Waters, trip planning gear, meal planning, uh, routes. Um, so I'd encourage you all to check that out. And uh, I'll put in the link, a link in the, the chat here uh, today. Um, I should also mention that we have two more webinars today. One is all about accessibility in the Boundary Waters, which will be led by a local nonprofit, Wilderness Inquiry, uh, who's a leader in connecting people with physical and intellectual disabilities to meaningful experiences through uh, outdoor re recreation. And that should be really interesting. And, and then the other is a, another former uh, uh, a board member, uh, Kim Young, who's traveled extensively in the Boundary Waters in Quetico, and she'll share some of her favorite campsites, lakes, and places in the Boundary Waters. So definitely check that out at 12 p.m. And you can still sign up for those on our website at friends-bwca.org slash REI uh, under the events section. So a couple of housekeeping items before Dan gets started. Uh, there's a there's a chat function at the bottom where you can make comments. And we also have the Q&A function as well for typing questions. So Dan can answer your questions uh, at the end. And that about covers it. Um, I'd like to introduce Dan Pauly. Dan's the author of a popular guide, guidebook for planning in the Boundary Waters called Exploring the Boundary Waters. So check that out. He's also the former board chair of Friends of the Boundary Waters wilderness. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing this uh, presentation, and I'm sure you all are too. So uh, take it away, Dan. Good. Thank you, Dave. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, hope you're having a good morning. And uh, as Dave said, in Minneapolis, it's very nice today. Beautiful. I know some folks are outside of the Twin Cities, and so hopefully you've got good weather. Um, we're going to go over a bunch of stuff today, but I wanted to start off uh, just with a quick overview of the Boundary Waters. And um, if, you're, if you haven't been up there uh, or don't know the details, over a million acres of protected wilderness, uh, and that's in the much larger Superior National Forest. So when you think about the greater Boundary Waters uh, ecosystem, uh, 1 million acres plus, uh, almost 1.1 million actually, is within the actual wilderness, the Boundary Waters wilderness that's um, at that highest level of protection and limits in terms of uh, you know, visit and impacts. But then, you know, that's over a thousand lakes and streams and over 2,000 campsites where you can uh, spend the night. And so massive area, uh, very much a unique water rich U.S. wilderness. If you um, were to look at largest wilderness areas in the United States, uh, especially in the lower 48, uh, there's really two of them that are significant water wildernesses. This and the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Wilderness, which is part of the Everglades. Uh, but most of our, our wilderness areas are, you know, mountainous areas, great for hiking. But if you're looking for something different, uh, there's nothing like the Boundary Waters. Uh, and it's a chance to see a, a, a part of the country that's gorgeous and wild and very uh, interesting to see. So uh, I have a quote here on this slide by Sir Gerd Olson, who um, has uh, been gone for a couple of decades, but was a important author and had a big role in protecting the wilderness as it is today. And uh, his quote is, there's no magic, there is magic, excuse me, in the feel of a paddle and the movement of a canoe, a magic compounded of distance, adventure, 
solitude and peace. And I think uh, that captures uh, in a small way some of what you can experience up in the Boundary Waters Wilderness. So my next slide shows where uh, the Boundary Waters is. I, I mapped out the REI locations in the sort of uh, multi-state area. Uh, I know this presentation normally would have been in Bloomington, but for sort of the uh, still some restrictions on gathering in terms of uh, classes like this. But um, I know uh, folks from all over Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, they all uh, come to the Boundary Waters, as do people from all over the country. So I just mapped this out in terms of location. The Boundary Waters, as I, as I mentioned, a uh, million plus acres up on the Canadian border in red here. Uh, you know, it's really a one day, uh, one day travel from anywhere in the country. I note that like you can get up there if you're if you're in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, it's about a four and a half, five hour drive. Madison, I mean, these are different places where there are uh, REIs. Uh, seven hour drive, probably seven and a half from Des Moines, nine hours from Chicago. Um, and if you were to fly, you can fly right into Duluth from Chicago, for example. Uh, and that's going to be maybe uh, five hours of driving plus that flight. So not that bad, a seven hour flight and drive from the coast. Um, if you were to fly into Duluth or depending into Minneapolis. So accessible uh, from really anywhere in the country. Uh, and if you're coming up for say a, a, a week long trip or even a four or five day, three day trip, uh, there's a lot of stuff to see around the bottom. Right? You can drive through Duluth up the North shore of Lake Superior. So I just want to put that into perspective. If you haven't been up there, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, it relatively accessible. It's the busiest, it's the busiest wilderness area uh, or the most visited wilderness area in the United States. So. Uh, people know it's great, uh, but you can still get up there and have some real solitude and enjoy the Boundary Waters for all it offers. Uh, what I'm going to go over today is a couple of things. And I, I'm going to assume some folks haven't been to the Boundary Waters before, uh, maybe most of you, and you're trying to get some basic information, so go over that. A little bit of maybe slightly more advanced information to some thoughts, and then a little bit of route planning stuff, give you some ideas on kinds of routes that I, I would recommend for different groups and some specific routes, but really you're probably gonna wanna make your own route, design your own route um, and give you some ideas on how to do that depending on your group, what you're trying to accomplish, how long you're up there and the like. So we'll start off, the first part is gonna be some of the rules, some of the gear you wanna have and some safety stuff. And then we'll go into a little bit of route stuff. So in terms of you know the important boundary waters rules, uh, the first one, because you might act upon this pretty soon, actually, if you're going up, is you have to have a permit all year round. If you're going to go into the Boundary Waters, you have to have a permit. Uh, and from May 1st to the end of September, which is certainly the key, the, the, the main travel time in the Boundary Waters, uh, you have to get a reservation in advance. All right. And the Friends of the Boundary Waters on their website, they have links to get to how you make that reservation. But you, you have to reserve those in advance. Reservations are now open for this summer. They open up uh, uh, in January. And uh, you go in at a specific entry point, and I'll, I'll go over those in a second, on a specific day. And that's, um, so that's what you're gonna reserve is a certain day, say Friday, uh, and a certain entry point. And those entry points are limited by how many people can go in per day. Some have more, some have fewer, depending upon sort of how many lakes and campsites really are readily accessible. Uh, another important thing to note is group size cannot exceed nine people, okay? So you can never have more than nine people in one location in the Boundary Waters at one time, all right? So the obvious limitation there is you can't go up with more than nine people. So any group that goes up is gonna be nine people or less and actually four watercraft um, or fewer. Um, so. Uh, you know, that limit on nine people applies to your group. That's how many people can be in a campsite. But it also applies to like, if you're at a portage, um, as you're entering, you know, the trails between lakes are, ported, are referred to as portages. And you can't have more than nine people in, in a location on a portage at a time. And so where that becomes relevant would be, um, maybe you're starting your trip, you're going to relatively, you know, a relatively more popular entry point and there's a group of say six people in front of you and you've got six people in your group. You need to wait till they like say clear out of that entry point, that, that portage, maybe get, get across or get part way across before you would start. Um, and the reason for that uh, in terms of the portages is 
Um, the more people you would have on a portage, say like if there were a whole bunch of people congregated at the landing, then you're going to have gear spread out and it creates a bigger uh, impact, you know, less, more erosion, all those things. So the nine person limit um, would also apply again, as I said, in the campsite. Um, and so you can't go up, you can't like, you can't split your group. Say you had 16 people want to go. You can't have a group of eight and eight and go up there um, and then say, get together for meals or something like that. If you had like two groups, um, they just would have like eight and eight, they just have to stay separate from each other for the whole trip. So you never have more than nine people in one location. Um, something that's pretty important is you can only camp in a designated U.S. Forest Service campsite. Uh, those are going to be on, we'll talk about maps a little bit, but any Boundary Waters map that you want to use is going to show all the designated campsites. And that's with pretty much no, pretty much few exceptions, that's where you have to camp overnight. And there's going to be a, a metal fire grate, and then there'll be a latrine, which will be just sort of a plastic uh base, if you will, for, for what would be a toilet. I mean, no running water, it's essentially an unenclosed outhouse, but um, that's where you can camp. And that's where you can spend the night. Uh, no cans and bottles or cans and bottles are not allowed except for medications and insect repellents. repellents. Uh, and then there are additional rules relating to campfires. Uh, notably, you can have campfires and you can gather firewood. It's just that you, you, know, you need to gather uh, dead and down firewood and there's some other limitations. But one of the uh, actually, one of the really kind of neat things about the Bounty Waters, unlike many places, including, say, national parks uh, and uh, state parks, for example, you can't collect firewood. And sometimes you can't even have fires. You know, if you're at a high alpine level, you usually can't have a fire for various reasons, uh, just in terms of impact on the ecosystem. But you can have campfires. And it's great. And you don't have to go down to some, you know, uh, office to buy the firewood. You can collect it and have a great fire. Um, most of the boundary waters in terms of lake number are going to be motor motor free so there's no outboards no trolling motors none of those things um, but there are some lakes uh basswood uh a few other ones that are large lakes that do have motors and so if that's an important thing to you you'd want to make sure you're going to a place uh that either, i guess does or does not have motors but uh mo most of the permits do not allow you to have a motor up in the boundary waters and then there's you know, rules on, for example, firearms. Uh, you know, the firearms are allowed in the Boundary Waters. I, I sometimes get the question like, I mean, should I be concerned about bears and fire and have a firearm? I think there's, that's absolutely no reason. To, you don't have to be concerned about bears in that regard. Uh, the bears that are up in the Boundary Waters are black bears. Um, the most important thing around bears is going to be uh, keeping a clean campsite, hanging your food, or keeping a, a bear-proof container, which we'll kind of go over a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's no reason, in my opinion, to have a firearm in the boundary waters, certainly not for safety in that regard. Uh, and then the last thing you, you need to follow, and the Forest Service has class, has like instruction on this, leave no trace principles, which are basically, you know, leaving the boundary waters um, in a fashion so there's no, that, that you're not, uh, people can't tell essentially you were up there before, so no garbage and things like that. But also, um, it does come down to things like noise being, you know, sure that you're not making a lot of noise in your campsite at night so other people can hear you if they're on the same lake, things like that. And this kind of all these rules feed together, like the, the not exceeding five people or nine people uh, should keep things like, you know, impact on campsites to a minimum, things like that. Uh, and uh, in the last couple of years, one of the really, really great things has been there's been a lot of new folks going to the Boundary Waters who hadn't been there before. People looking for something to do now that um, there were a lot of things they couldn't do with COVID uh, in terms of travel. And so that's been, it's opened up the Boundary Waters to folks who hadn't been there, which is really a great thing and something the Friends uh, has been working hard to promote as well. And REI, REI did. Um, but there hasn't always been the same education and awareness of some of these rules. And so I've seen campsites that, you know, were, were damaged, frankly, because of uh, maybe too many people or cutting down live trees. So this education component is important. Um, and if you're going up with folks, make sure they know the rules so the boundary water stays uh, really in a, uh, in, a, in a pristine state for future visitors, future generations. So what I have here um, next is, this is an overview map. This is blowing up the map that you saw at the top. This would have been red on that at the start. This is what was red at that first screen. And 
uh, this, 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 the Boundary Waters is really in like three different areas, first, a second, and a third, the biggest central area here, uh, but then two other like uh, regions. And uh, again, this is up the Canadian border. We have Lake Superior, um, about four and a half mile, four and a half hours north of the Minneapolis area. And uh, some things to note when you're kind of thinking about coming in, um, the two sort of main, main jumping off areas for going up to the Boundary Waters would either be Ely or Grand Marais, which are both nice towns up in that area. And both of them have full, you know, outfitter, uh, uh, air, uh, outfitter businesses who can do stuff like providing gear you need if you wanted to rent stuff, things like that. Um, and then uh, for, there's Forest Service ranger stations in each of those areas where you can pick up your permit, which you can also pick up at the uh, outfitters. And in the past, you've been able to pick it up, like you may actually issue them on by phone during COVID, but I think we're going back to in person this year. Uh, but then not on this map is down here where it'd be a little bit south of what we show here is uh, the small town or community of Tofty, which also has a four service ranger station. And there's one over here by Crane Lake and Or. So those are different places where you can pick up stuff. Um, but then again, the main routes, you know, I just like to mention these. So you have, if you're coming from Grand Marais, you can go up the Gunflint Trail, which I'm showing here in my um, with my highlighter. And all along the Gunflint Trail uh, are a bunch of entry points. And we'll talk about some of those a little bit more today. And you can, um, you know, you would go if you if you had a reservation for one of these, you know, as I as I sort of mentioned, you'd park your vehicle, you'd go in uh, on a given day and you can explore the region that you want to go to. Once once you get your permit and you go in that location, then you're not limited where you would go. Like you don't have to camp at specific sites other than they have to be designated sites, but you can go as far and as wide as you would want. So that's Gunflin Trail out of Grand Marais. But then also if you were out of Tofty, you could go up the Sawville Trail to, um, there's uh, the Sawville Lake Entry Point and Sawville Outfitters is up there. And uh, you can also go up what's called the Caribou Trail. Um, which is up to Brule Lake. So you have these different roads. The, the Gunflint Trail is paved. The other ones are not paved much of their way. But then you have also out of Ely, you can go up the Echo Trail, which starts paved and then stops being paved to all these areas. Or you can go the Fernburg Road, which kind of ends over here, past a little bit past what's Snowbank Lake and uh, the Cushery River and Lake One. So those are, and then you can also come up through, this is, this is Vermilion Lake. So you have all these different ways in, okay? Um, but this is kind of gives you that geography. Uh, up here in Canada is, I don't show on the map, but is the Quetico. Uh, and so that's the Quetico Provincial Park, which is similar to the Boundary Waters in that it's a canoe wilderness area. So this is sort of that overview. Um, and again, you're going to want to reserve a permit for each one of these, any one of these places. And if you're going this summer, I would get that permit pretty soon because um, the, some of the more popular weekends, for example, will fill up. Uh, somewhat quickly. Now, uh, say, you, say you've decided where you're gonna go. Um, and by the way, like the friends information about these entry points, you know, I have a guidebook out there that describes each entry point and the range as it go. But once you have your area where you're gonna go, then you're gonna be thinking, okay, what about, for example, gear that I'm gonna need to bring along? Um, the most, you know, classic thing that you're gonna need is a canoe, right? You're gonna need a canoe if you're going to the Boundary Waters. Uh, and, uh, Generally, you're looking for a lightweight canoe uh, if you're going to be doing significant portaging, which we'll talk about. So Kevlar and alternative carbon fiber canoes. So the picture of here is a Winona Kevlar canoe. Um, this is a Sundowner that I don't think they make anymore, but there's a bunch of them and there's other companies. I talk here about North Star and Winona are two popular Minnesota brands, but there are some other companies that make um, these very lightweight canoes. Um, a tandem like this might maybe, you know, might weigh about 50 pounds, give or take a little bit. Um, and that's going to be maybe what you see a lot of up in the Boundary Waters. Uh, you can also definitely use an aluminum canoe. Um, and there's some older technologies like um, that maybe aren't as used so much anymore, but some polymer canoes that are good, very good. No problem with those. Um, they're just going to be heavier until you get the portage of those. It's going to be more work. Uh, and in, in, if you're thinking about portaging, you always want to have a yoke on your canoe. So the yoke is, fits over the, the middle thwart. So it's, it's just, you know, it's shoulder pads. So that canoe can be carried over your head. All right. Um, and that works great, right? If you're, if you're maybe on the stronger side, you might have a pack 
and the canoe if you're going over, or you just might have the canoe, you know? Um, and one thing I've seen is folks go up and maybe haven't been to the Valley Waters before. Uh, they might bring a canoe up that doesn't have a yoke on it. And if it doesn't have a yoke, it's just really hard to carry over a portage um, because, you know, the portage is wine, there's maybe a little rocks. Um, and just carrying a canoe, even if there's two people on the one on the front, one in the back, on a long portage, you're, you're sort of stretched out. It's not, it's just not that great. Um, you can usually rent a yoke from outfitters. They have portable ones you can put on. Um, if you have your own canoe that doesn't have a yoke, if you're going to be going on a bunch, you might buy one of those yokes. Uh, but having that yoke is pretty important, for, especially for longer portages. Short portage, maybe you just carry it across. But longer portage, the yoke is something that you really do want to have on there, or it's going to be a more challenging situation. Um, now, canoes are relatively expensive. And if you haven't been up there before, you're not going to know much, you know, maybe borrow from a friend or you can rent them. So all of these things, most of what I'm talking about today, that's special to the Boundary Waters, you can rent um, right near the Boundary Waters in, at, at an outfitter. Um, and so, you know, renters, rentals are available. Uh, if you're kind of wondering, like, what does that cost? Um, a canoe like this Winona, maybe it's going to rent for about $50 a day. All right. So that's, that's going to be a $2,000 to $2,500 canoe. So, you know, it's about 50 bucks a day generally to rent something like that. Uh, sometimes people think, well, what else could I use besides a canoe? Could I take a kayak up? Yeah, you could take a kayak up. It's going to be harder to portage. Um, one thing you, you can't take up um, is, say, a watercraft that has mechanical sort of um, paddling type attachments. So like a, row, a rowing shell, even a more of a, not a racing one. You can't, you can't use those in the boundary waters. You can't take pontoons to the boundary waters. So even if you had a motorized portage a permit, um, you can't have pontoons, you just have boats, uh, things like that. And there's, if you were to go on with a motorized watercraft, you, there's always going to be limits, never more than 25 horsepower. Um, and again, overwhelming majority of people would not be going up with a water, with a, with a motorized watercraft. So you have your canoe, um, then what, what else, uh, are you going to need? We're well, going to need to have a way, oops, I went the wrong direction there. You're going to need a way to carry your gear. All right. And I kind of recommend just in the biggest sense, you're kind of going backpacking with canoes as opposed to going car camping with canoes. And I say that in the sense that you don't want to have a crazy amount of extra gear along because you're still carrying it over a portage and that becomes a hassle if you've got too much. Um, and so if you're sort of thinking about backpacking with your gear, um, you're going to need a backpack. All right. And so what I have here is what I, what I would say are the three main types of backpacks. So on the left, you have what is sort of the classic design canvas, in this case, traditional materials, canvas and leather. Um, Frost Ripper is a company up uh, in the Arrowhead there up in Duluth that makes uh, very nice canvas, um, canvas backpacks. Uh, Duluth Pack is the company that maybe first made these. Sometimes people will call them Duluth Packs. They're still available too. So that's your classic design, right? That's going to be you know, that's going to be canvas. It's going to last a long time. Um, it's not going to be waterproof. So you're going to generally put your stuff in there, either knowing it's going to get wet, like say your pots and pans, that's no big deal. Or you're going to line it, you know, with a plastic bag. And uh, you can get from different outfitters, big heavy duty plastic bags that'll fit in there. So your sleeping bag clothes could go in something that should keep them dry. Uh, but even then you would want to have a second, like say your sleeping bag, you want to put your sleeping bag in, say, a waterproof bag. Could be a garbage bag, or there's different bags for that purpose that are waterproof. And then you'd put it inside that second bigger waterproof bag because um, you don't, you know, you you, you don't want to get your stuff wet. And generally, this is going to sit in the bottom of your canoe, uh, and there's going to be water get in there for various reasons. Just even your canoe paddling might bring some water in. So assume your pack is going to get wet. It's just it's not going to stay dry. And the things that you need to keep dry, you're going to want to have within something that's a waterproof enclosure. Now, that's your that's your classic uh, sort of canvas backpack, the loop pack, as we might call it. Now, in recent years, uh, there's been some nice designs made by a number of companies, many in Minnesota here. Uh, Cook Custom Sewing is one. Uh, Granite Gear is another one that have taken that design and modernized it with modern materials 
you know, nice heavy duty nylon, basically, maybe more padded straps. Uh, and so this is another design that you can use. Uh, people like to use these. Um, they're great, kind of the same benefits that you'd get out of the classic design, but then also a uh, maybe, you know, a little more durable candy. Um, one thing, uh, if you'll notice both of these packs, they're sort of squared off uh, and sort of flat. So something like this is going to fit well into a canoe, right? It can, it, it can fit between the thwarts, those crossbars. It can fit right in the bottom of your canoe. Um, what's, what's nice about these relative maybe to what you'd have if you have like a more of a backpacking pack for like going into the Rocky Mountains is they, that, that fitting in the canoe without raising your center of gravity because they can stay very low. Um, if you go with a backpacking model, sometimes they're so long that they don't really fit between the thwarts too well. It's a little harder to get in. Um, and so you have them propped up, which makes it just a little less stable. Uh, but you know, that, can, that can work well too. I mean, I've done both ways, but if you were to buy a pack for this purpose or rent one, something like this is good. Now, <clears throat> a third alternative, one that I've used all of these, and I do use all of them, but one that I do like actually is there's a variety of waterproof packs you can get. This is the Sea line makes this one um, that I'm showing. That's again, a simple backpack, but it has a, the top will open up uh, and it has a rolled seal so that you can close it up. And those things stay very watertight. I've actually not had a problem with them, um, but you'd wanna maintain it and make sure the seals are good. But this will keep your gear dry as well. Even then, if I had like a down sleeping bag, I'd probably have it in some place waterproof. So <clears throat> these are your options, different pack options. Again, you're gonna wanna um, keep your gear to the minimum and you're going to want to, uh, uh, you know, um, keep it, have your gear in backpacks pretty much so you can carry it across easily. Uh, one thing I'm going to note, just since I'm talking about that gear aspect in the canoes, is when you're thinking about a portage, um, you know, going across once would be single portaging. And say, uh, say it's a quarter mile, that's a single portage. You carry your gear for a quarter mile. But if you have to, what we might consider double pet portaging, you're going to go over it, back, and then over again. So it's actually double portage is kind of triple portage. And so that quarter mile becomes three quarters of a mile. And so there's a real benefit in getting everything across in one load, um, or if you had to two loads. But it, once you're getting more than two loads, you're really <clears throat> extending what could be a quarter mile portage to a mile and a quarter, um, which is a big difference. So better to think well in advance, like what do I need? And what do I not need? And leave the stuff you don't need behind. All right. So that might be, you know, the big cooler. Maybe you're not bringing that. Heavy chairs. Maybe you're not bringing that, for example. Um, so that's kind of your canoes and packs. Uh, another sort of thing to think about that's sort of related to gear um, and safety and something important in the Maui waters is I talked earlier just briefly about bears. Okay. And so there can be issues with nuisance bears, nuisance bears in the Maui waters. And you got to keep your food from them, A, because you don't want them to eat your food, but also you don't want them to get acclimated to food. Bears, um, you know, smart animal, once they associate humans with food, then they're going to be kind of for their whole life thinking about humans and food, and they're going to be raiding camps, which has not really generally been a problem in the Boundary Waters the last 20 or 30 years, because people have kept clean camps. But I think it's becoming more of a problem, because the last couple of years, maybe the bears, the bears have become more aggressive. Um, in sort of finding food, maybe they've been getting food um, in ways they hadn't, if there's been folks who haven't been as, as knowledgeable about keeping the food away. So the two things you can do that work right are you can hang your food. Um, and this is a example of a drying, I think it's actually from the Forest Service. There's different ways of hanging your food from a tree, but you do want to keep it 12 feet off the ground and six feet away from, say, the closest branch, whether it's from the top or from the side in this case. And this is a two pulley system. Um, we won't go into that too much right now from a time standpoint, but that works great. Uh, assuming you've got good, good trees to hang from. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is use a bear resistant food container. Most of these are plastic. There's some soft ones out there as well that are, that are, that are excellent. You can definitely use those. And sometimes you'll be in an area where there's not much in the way of trees because it could have been a forest fire or blowdown and parts of the boundary waters um, were impacted really starting about 22 years ago, there was a big blowdown and there's been some other ones since then. So uh, if you're going up 
and your concern, like, oh, could I, what's going to be, what's going to work in terms of um, hanging my pack? Is there going to be a good spot? Generally, there is a good spot to hang your pack, but if you're concerned and you're going to a place where maybe there'd been a fire in the recent past, like um, the Pagami Creek fire was down um, in that central area, you could uh, ask that you call the Forest Service Ranger Station. They would kind of give you an idea, or you could just default to having sort of uh, some sort of bear proof container like this. Um, one thing I will mention, because actually it was news even to me not that long ago, is that you will see um, places rent, and I own one, for example, the big blue, big blue uh, barrels that have packs, like pack straps put on them. I think those barrels are reused for maybe shipping chain, but um, they are actually not bear proof. A bear can dig through that thing and tear through it pretty fast. And so that's something to note that that's not a bear proof container. And also, I would note that these are not just recommendations, but these are requirements. And so if you were had your food in an unsecured way, it's either not hanging or it's not, you don't have a hanging setup or you don't have a um, bear proof container, the Forest Service can definitely ticket you for that. Um, but the real motivation for not hang, for hanging or, or protecting your food would be to, to keep it from the bears. So you keep your food and the bears don't get acclimated. Uh, a couple of other things um, in terms of safety. You want to wear a personal flow chaser device and be careful, all right? Uh, and so in 2020 in Minnesota, the probably 2021 data now, but there were 16 boating fatalities in the state of Minnesota, not, not in the boundary waters. Um, I'm not sure if there were any that year, but 13 of those deaths were people not wearing a personal flotation device. Uh, and so always, always have your life jacket on. Uh, when you're in the water, even if it's a really short, like you're just going out to, to, to fill up a water jug or you're just fishing for 10 minutes or something like that. Like you definitely, definitely should have your life jacket on. Um, cause you know, the water, uh, you're in a canoe and it's, it can be unstable. And if you turn over, it's probably going to be, or might be very sudden and you don't have time to prepare yourself. Even if you're a very, very good swimmer, cold water and moving water can both be quite hazardous. So, um, uh, that, you know, that's something I, I always emphasize. I always have my life jacket, PFD is the other name, formal name for it. I always have that on. And I just want to mention too, um, as the ice comes off the lakes right now, if you go up there, if you fall into cold water, you know, and the boundary waters is cold much of the year, uh, you, have a, you have a gasping reflex where you inhale and uh, it's sort of, in, it's involuntary. And if you're underwater when that happens, because you didn't have a personal flotation device on, you're going to inhale water and you just might not come up, right? And if you have a life jacket on, hopefully your face is above, uh, your mouth is above the water if you, if you had that gasping response. But even if it's not, because you just flipped over, you're gonna come to the surface, you can ca hopefully cough out any water you took in. So definitely wear your personal flotation device. Um, most of the time when people have died in boundary waters, it's not very common, but you know, one, one a year is not, definitely happens one or two. It's usually because, not always, but usually did not have a life jacket or personal flotation device on it. And so you definitely don't want to be one of those people, even if you're a good swimmer. Now, another thing you need for gear, uh, and um, somewhat, you know, different than say you went to a state park or something, you definitely have to have proper navigation gear, and you're going to need maps for the boundary waters, all right? Uh, and you're going to, you can use GPS. Uh, you can have something on your phone, you have an app on your phone, that's great. But ultimately, you need to have something that doesn't require batteries for that you can navigate in. Uh, all the Boundary Waters maps you can buy are going to be waterproof. Now, it's very important that they have portages, campsites, and entry points shown on there because we talked about like you can only camp at those um, campsites. The portages you need to get between lakes and the entry points are also you know required. Uh, there's three different companies that sell those, Fisher Maps, McKinsey Maps, and Voyager Maps. Uh, I know at the front that I was one of the founders of Voyager Maps, but all three of these are, are, are sold at REI stores in the area, uh, in the region. So you know, these are all ones that you can use. Um, I just highlighted here some of the differences. You know, they, they're all waterproof. They're all going to have the entry points. They're all going to have portage distances. So you know, all of the key things are right there. Um, and then there are some other differences, such as they, and they all cover the full boundary waters, but things like portage difficulty and some campsite numbers, some other things are going to vary by map. Um, one thing I would note is National Geographic also carries, they sell um, 
Trails Illustrated is the brand, but a two map set that has the boundary waters on it. You can get these at REI, good maps, nothing wrong with them. Um, but the detail, in my opinion, just not enough to actually navigate with. They're a nice planning map, but I wouldn't navigate off of those. Um, but uh, but they, they're a good map. So I think all four of these you can get at, at most regional REIs. Uh, so with that in mind, okay, so you've got your canoe set up, you've got your permit, or you're gonna get your permit, you got a pack, you're gonna get your maps. Um, what are some of the route principles and example routes, all right? And so in terms of route, principles I'm seeing. So I see we're about 10, almost 10, 40. So we're going we're gonna to go through this stuff. But so some stuff in terms of routes, um, key route variables, you know, you're thinking about who is going, um, what distance are you trying to cover, portages, types of lakes and activities. So I'm going to go over each of these in a, in a, in a bit. But in terms of who is going, um, it's going to make a big difference if you're going with people been there before or not as well, how mobile they are. So, you know, after this presentation, you're gonna, if you join, there'll be some stuff about wilderness inquiry. The boundary water is really for everybody, right? Young, old, different levels of ability. Um, but, you know, you're gonna tailor your trip depending on those things. And we'll talk about distance to cover, think of a little bit about forges and difficulty and some about the types of lakes. So now in terms of distance uh, and, and daily travel estimates, right? So you lay out your maps, and you're thinking, how far can we go in a day, right? Uh, having been to the Valley Waters many, many times and with many different groups, I sort of recommend that you consider that you're going to cover about two miles an hour, okay? So that's just average traveling. Um, I have found that, you know, when you're on the water canoeing, you know, moving typical person is going to go like three miles an hour, but portaging slower. And so averaging out like two miles Per hour is, is a good ballpark estimate for a typical group, typical. Now, that means like a daily group might estimate would go, you know, six to 12 miles. That'd be three to six hours, you know. Um, some groups are going to cover that in less, the long distance, some are going to do more, but that's a good estimate, okay? Six to 12. I think if you haven't been there before, it's really easy on the map to think, well, we could go 20 miles today. That's a really long day for most people in the boundary waters who have if you've never been before, that's really a very long day. So six to 12 per day is kind of what I would ballpark. And if you're moving um, and you're just kind of looking through like two miles an hour is a good estimate. Slower, if you have a lot of portages, longer, um, it's gonna take, yeah, it's gonna be slower, take you longer if you have a lot of portages. And if you don't have many portages, then maybe, you know, you could canoe in a big lake, three miles an hour is probably reasonable. So now, that's the big question. What about portages? Um, and so that's the term that's used for these areas between lakes. Um, you know, if you're going up, I recommend keeping portages few for, and short for new visitors. Uh, I've just known folks who've taken people up. They may have this lake that they really love that's got a 200 rod portage and they want to go over that long portage with some folks who have never been boundary waters. And it's tough if you've never been there before. And so a portage is 16 and a half feet. So like a hundred rod portage would be 1600 feet, um, basically pretty close to a, a 16, 650, pretty close to a quarter mile. So, um, you know, I recommend doing a few portages per day max. So there's routes that are great that don't have any portage. Um, and I, I kind of nothing over a hundred rods. That's basically a quarter mile for first time visitors, right? Um, it just, it just would be a lot for someone who's not been out there. And then, um, generally lakes that are accessible only by long portages are going to have fewer visitors. Okay. The forest service this year has actually reduced the number of, number of groups, um, the entry points, I didn't go into that in detail, but a few of those entry points now have fewer people that can go in every, every day. And the reason for that is, as I said earlier, there's been a big significant increase of visitors. Uh, in the last uh, two years. Uh, but with that, so if you're looking for a little more isolation than you get maybe at some of the entry points, entry point lakes, if you go over a long portage and you look at your map, if there's a long portage to lakes that are not otherwise accessible, you're gonna have absolutely fewer people on the other side of that. Um, another thing to note is the Forest Service maintains portages to three different standards. And the more remote they are, 
the more rugged they're going to be, right? And so, um, you know, if you get deeper into the boundary waters, you're going to see the trail is going to be maybe a little rough, maybe a little overgrown, um, more, more, more boggy, like muddy, potentially. If you're right at the edge of the, edge of the boundary waters, um, usually the portages are, are, are a little bit, little bit better maintained. Although even then, it's a wilderness area, so the Forest Service doesn't, I mean, these are not well-groomed mowed paths, right? They're wilderness, wilderness trails. Um, so that's uh, the portage concepts. Uh, now you can see these folks here in this picture, they have a yoke on their canoe. So this beautiful uh, cedar strip canoe, but that canoe would be carried out of the water and then would be portaged uh, over the shoulders. Now, another thing about this picture, just wanted to point out um, is that uh, if you look here, these people are wet booting it. I don't have time today to talk about all of here, but most folks who go to the Bounty Waters are gonna go up and you know, get their feet wet in terms of getting them out of the canoe uh, because there's not, there's not landings here, right? In the sense, there's not like a dock. So to, to get in and out of your canoe, you will often be using, you know, you get out, uh, probably stand in the water, haul your gear out, haul the gear canoe out of the water and, and carry it over, as opposed to trying to keep your feet dry. And so, um, this person here is wearing some keens, which is an option. Uh, I like to wear sort of an, an enclosed shoe or boot. It can even be an old tennis shoe um, so that I don't cut my feet and stuff like that. But there's, there's pluses and minuses of different footwear, but you should plan on getting your feet wet. Um, generally, that's gonna be the easier way in and out of canoe and actually kind of the more, more stable way. The last thing in terms of activities uh, or in terms of some of these planning stuff would be activities, okay? so. Um, if you're going to go fishing, um, that's going to impact where you're going to want to go. The Boundary Waters, actually, the state record northern pike came out of Basswood Lake, which is in the Boundary Waters. And the state record walleye came out of a creek between Saginaga and uh, Seagull Lake, uh, which is technically out of the Boundary Waters right there. So the biggest walleye came there. And there's great bass fishing and great trout, lake trout fishing, too. So all those things are up there if you're going to fish. Um, blueberry picking, you know, something about that in terms of locations. So, but fishing, you're going to want to go where there's good fish, fish hopefully, which isn't much of the boundary waters. But um, the DNR, Minnesota DNR, has a lake finder site that will give you ideas on those things. Um, no, you know, generally uh, catch and release is encouraged because the fish uh, are slow growing in the boundary waters. But if you do catch fish to eat, you know, they recommend maybe one or two meals per trip kind of thing. Now, the next thing I have on here is blueberry picking. People love to do that. That's going to be best, you know, mid to late summer. But in particular areas where the, there was a fire maybe a few years ago. So, you know, um, there are a lot of areas, especially like off the Gunflin Trail, and also kind of I, I, I showed you where Sawbill Outfitters was. Sawbill, like west of Sawbill, there was a significant fire a few years ago. Those are going to be maybe your best blueberry picking areas. And notably, those areas that have been recently burned sometimes have the best wildlife. That's the more, more, um, invigorated uh, area in terms of that. And so like, that's the best places to see moose as well. If you're gonna go swimming, you know, the later in the summer, the warmer the water's gonna be. So like, if you go in right, you know, Memorial Day weekend, it's definitely a lot colder than Labor Day weekend. Uh, hiking, it's, it's, hiking is not nearly as popular in the Boundary Waters as canoeing, but if you wanted to hike, in my opinion, the best hiking would be up along the border route trail, which is north of the Gunflint. And so, we're not going to go into that too much today, but there's good hiking up there that are along, kind of along the border, and there's some campsites just for hiking, and, and you can get down to the lakes. That's an option. Or there are a number of trails. The Kekakopic would be a well-known one that you can hike um, uh, in the Boundary Waters as well. And some of those have their own hiking uh, permits that you would need to pull as well. And then the last thing I note here, stargazing. Uh, the Boundary Waters is a, you know, has uh, uh, some of the, the darkest skies in the, in the United States. And so it's, it could be a great place to see stars and certainly the Northern Lights uh, at the right times of year. So now another, um, another thing we're going to hit in a second here, some sort of route planning stuff and kind of merging into that now. So one thing to keep in mind as you're heading up uh, is think about large open water. Uh, because that can be a big issue when you're planning a trip, all right? And especially be alert to lakes with large west to east exposures. The, the prevailing winds in the boundary waters are out of the west. Um, and uh, if you need to go across that 
like prevailing wind in a big lake, you can have wave issues. And so I, sh- I want to show you here an example of a lake where that can be a challenge for folks, right? So this is Brule Lake. This is kind of on the eastern side of the Boundary Waters. It's got its own entry point. Uh, it's a magnificent lake, but each of these squares on here is one mile. And so you can see how there's some open water stretches east to west to east that are going to be more than three miles, depending upon how you set, you know, where you're measuring from three, four miles. And what can happen in a situation like this is you could have a wind coming out of the west. And you're going to, by the time you get over to some of these islands here, the waves can be pretty big. And typically, if you've got the waves coming like head on or to your to your rear from the stern versus from or from the bow, you can kind of cut through or ride those waves, right? That's not so big a deal. But if you have to go across that, like say north to south, then much more difficult because those waves are coming over your side. So a lake like this would be best um, traveled on probably early in the morning before there's going to be much of a, hopefully much of a breeze, especially if you're coming up. So like Brule Lake, you can come in here and then you can go out on the west side up to I think it's town, Townline Lake. There's a couple lakes up this way. Like going this way is not so bad, but if you were going to go up and kind of cross into uh, the cones, there's some lakes here. When you turn here, it's going to be more difficult if there's a wind out of the west. So I keep that in mind. I've known people on like big lakes like this, you can kind of get wind bound. Um, that would be a, the big thing. And there's other lakes you could look at, Basswood, other lakes that may have big open stretches. You'd want to have that in mind. And I wouldn't go personally on those big lakes for first time trips. That would be my recommendation. Now, um, we have about 12 minutes. I'm going to go through some example routes. I'll go kind of quick. This is the last that I have prepared for today, but I'll go through this quick in case we have a couple of questions. Um, but I've got some day trips. I've got some weekend type trips and some week long trips. Um, these are just examples of things you could think about. And I think folks, um, you're going to plan your own trip. There's no perfect trip. Um, and you know, there's different resources online. I've, I've got a book out there too you could use that um, gives you ideas for these different entry points. But in terms of date, so, and then we had, this is again, the overall view. I sort of pointed this out, like here's Ely, here's Grand Marais, um, you know, Toft, I don't think it's shown on here, but it's down here too. So these are, I'm going to show you just a few of these. And, you know, the Friends of the Boundary Waters has some of these on their website. In fact, these are all on their website and there's no more that you can kind of look at. So our first one we're going to talk about is down here by Alton Lake. And this would be an example of where you can go in. This is great because you can go right here, uh, Solval Outfitters. They would rent if you needed stuff, anything you want. They have a campsite, right? Or yeah, they have a campground there. You can stay the night beforehand. Stay the whole time there and just do a day trips in, in the Boundary Waters. But you can do some nice little loops here that are like a nice loop that's about three. Um, I think it's about three miles around, maybe a little longer. Easy access from Tofty, North South Lakes. So you're not concerned generally about big waves. And then if you wanted to get a you know a little bit further away from folks, you could go up um, towards Zenith Lake here. There's a pretty long portage, uh, but you could either just hike it for the day, or you'd come up this way, and there's going to be more areas that are not that heavily traveled. Or you can go saw the lake. There's there's different ways you can go out in different directions here. So there's a lot you can do here. But here would be an example of a nice little loop you could do. Another one would be Basswood Lake. So this is, um, I'm not sure if it's the largest, it might be the largest lake in the Boundary Waters. Huge lake stretches uh, across the core of the Boundary Waters, just uh, to sort of the north and east of Ely. But um, you could go into Basswood Lake by way of Fall Lake. You're going to have like three portages, four portages actually, to get into Basswood. And there's a whole lot of area you can explore from there. What's nice about this route, if you haven't been there before, is these portages are, are pretty smooth because you can take motor boats, you just have a pretty small boat over little on, on little portages, like you put wheels on your boat, you could haul them across there. So these are this is these trails are quite well groomed. If you've never been there, maybe you're going up with a person with limited mobility, not bad to get up this way. The disadvantage is much of these areas are going to allow motorized boats. Um, and so you're going to have some of that. But you can get over to some of the bays do not allow more boats, like once you get past certain areas. And um, so you could then have that solitude too. But this Basswood Lake, pretty easy to get into, a lot of area to explore. Um, so it's great for a short trip or a long trip. 
another example of a pretty popular, uh, actually, it's a pretty popular area. Um, and I think they did reduce the number of folks this year that can come in, but is they would, we would call it the numbers chain into Lake One, Lake Two, Lake Three, and Lake Four. And these are located kind of far east on the Fernberg Road out of Eastland. Okay. Um, and so this, um, this area is beautiful. The north side of this area, most of it had significant fires. Now it's, I think, almost 10 years ago. So that's great for blueberries. The south side, ironically, didn't burn so much. This is kind of at the edge of the fire. And so this would be an area you go in um, and uh, with the two different sort of ecosystems or different stages, more likely to see different kinds of birds, maybe see some moose. Um, there's going to be good fishing in here. Uh, portages are not that long. This is kind of a regular, relatively more popular area. So, uh, you know, it's more likely you're going to see other folks from your campsite um, than some of these other areas, but the very nice area, uh, great for a first type of visit. Um, now, another one, uh, those are sort of somewhat easier trips, uh, is you could go from Brule Lake, I was mentioning at one of my earlier slides. This is a 30 mile trip going, uh, you go either direction up through Cherokee Lake and up you could go over to what's called Frost Lake, which is beautiful. And you can loop all the way around um, through Long Island, Davis Lake, the, the, this is called the Cones. So this is, this is that great loop where you're gonna see, especially as you get up towards Long Island, fewer folks are gonna be in this area. Um, but this is a really nice wilderness trip if you're gonna go with maybe, you know, this isn't maybe a first trip unless you do a lot of camping, um, but uh, excellent, excellent trip could be a great week long trip. Another one, um, that I like, we talked earlier about Alton Lake. So this is coming up off the Sawbell Trail. Here you can go over to Grace Lake, Phoebe Lake, Polly Lake, Coma Lake, kind of uh, sweep around through. This is Laos Lake and the Laos River um, into what's called Wine Lake. But this area here is going to be some of those areas where the portages are really kind of rough, right? They're going to be tough. Some of them are really rocky, but that's great, right? That's what, if you're looking to get away from uh, things and want to real challenging wilderness trip. Something like this is really nice. If you're gonna come down here um, and you're gonna have like a, this is a very long portage, um, but if you're prepared for it, it's great, right? And then you can come out to Sawville Lake. That's an example of a really nice trip that might be a good week long trip. Um, and in fact, I think the Chris Knopp of the executive director of the Friends is doing this trip or something like it this summer. Um, and then another nice loop, uh, kind of coming out of Ely. And I'm just kind of, I know I'm going over these quickly, um, but give you some ideas. Uh, you can take uh, Moose Lake um, up into what's called Ensign Lake, which is a, is, is a pretty big lake. Uh, Moose Lake and not Newfound here in Sucker, this is leading over to Basswood, but these lakes do have motorized boats, including uh, some outfitters who can, can tow people up. So you could do a tow, but they'll tow, tow people up, um, say go to Basswood Lake. But then you can do a pretty nice loop through here Either, you know, you could do out and back on Knife Lake, which is not so bad for portaging, or you can do kind of a loop through here um, with a little more portaging, but some really pretty little lakes in there. This is, this is a classic kind of iconic Boundary Waters trip. I got just a couple more slides. And then- Yeah, actually, uh, Dan, one... I'm sorry. We gotta, we gotta wrap up um, uh, right now because uh, unfortunately uh, the next presentation is, is not able to get in and they have to set up oh, a, a okay. sign language interpreter. So sorry, that was oh, kind okay. of some booking, booking um, uh, problem on, on our side. So sorry about that. Um, but uh, thank you so much for, for presenting uh, all this information. And it was a great way to kind of kick off the boundary water season, you know, and now that we've got the spring weather and, uh, and uh, get, get people thinking about it. Um, and I'm sorry for those who, who a couple of uh, questions that, that we had, um, is Lyme disease an issue? Um, I think, yeah, there are deer ticks up there. So I'd say, you know, um, we have some information on Friends of the Boundary Waters website on uh, uh, bugs and on our YouTube page as well, but, you know, definitely you know, wear your uh, protective clothing and, uh, and, and check for that. Um, we also had a question on where to get a satellite phone. Um, I think uh, I think REI, uh, who's uh, part, you know partly responsible for the presentations today, would be a good place to start. I don't know if they have those uh, for rent. Do you know, Dan? Yeah, they do have stuff for rent, including what's called a um, 
Garmin InReach, which is not a phone, but you can text and you can rent those from Outfitters. REI would sell the Garmin, but you could rent it from Outfitters too. And I'll just say, I know we're going to ramp up, but Dave's Dave's address email is on the Friends of the Boundary Waters website. Is that right, Dave? Yeah. Um, so if you if someone sends like the next few days, like any questions, if you send them to Dave, he'll send them to me and I'll respond to them. If you do have questions, um, just, you know, uh, even like you have some route questions, get them to Dave in the next week and I'll, I'll get back to those quickly. Um, if Dave forwards them on, because I know people sometimes have questions. That'd be a great way to do it. Any any questions? Um, I can. Uh, it's probably too late to put my email address in the chat, but you can send them to our contact uh, at, at Friends of the Boundary Waters, or uh, you know, find an email uh, on there. And also, um, check out our resources on Friends of the Boundary Waters. Uh, friends-bwca.org. Um, we've got some some great stuff that would be a compliment to uh, some of the, the the wonderful information you presented here today, Dan. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we've got a couple more presentations uh, coming up today and head to our website to find out more information. But thank you, Dan, for, for the great presentation. And, and, and thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Great trips, everyone. Bye-bye.